This is the story behind the song with Pastor Donnie Swagger. A look at the words and background stories that inspire the great Christian hymns of the church. Hello, I'm Donnie Swagger, and welcome to another edition of the story behind the song. I hope that you are enjoying these programs. I know I enjoy making them. It's always uh, a privilege for me to bring information to people. That, that's kind of the job of, of a preacher. You, you are a dispenser of information. And I said it on one of the other tapings a while back that, that music is the language of the heart, the language of the soul. It's, it's the universal language. And when it comes to the gospel, Music is the second most important aspect of our Christian experience, second only to the preaching of the gospel. Even though I don't play, don't sing, have any musical uh, talent of my own, I I've been raised in and around music, gospel music, my, my whole life. It it's, it's, I cannot remember a day in my life that music wasn't a part of it somehow, some way. I have seen music, songs in a service begin to move the people until we'll, to where there was no preaching. The Holy Spirit would take a song and begin to speak to the hearts of people, begin to move in their hearts and lives, and next thing you know, the altars were full. I, I've actually been in services where one song would last well over an hour as the presence of the Lord would fill the house and stir the hearts of people. That, that's music, and it, it's such a comfort. And I, I believe that this program, The Story Behind the Songs, is a blessing to you. And if it is, please let us know. I, I would like to know what you think. I'd like to have your feedback. And secondly, I would like to have you let other people know about the program and uh, tell them to tune in and tell them what time it comes on. And, and I, I think they'll be blessed as well. The song that we are bringing to you today is not only a staple of the church, but it's really a song of history. It's been etched in the hearts and the lives and the minds of people that never darkened the door of a church, simply because of a period of time in American history that we call the Civil Rights Movement. The song that we're featuring today was sung by many of the uh, men and women who labored to bring equality to the races. It was Martin Luther King's favorite song. It was sung at his funeral. And as a premonition, I believe, of the fact that he knew that he wasn't going to live much longer, the last public appearance he ever made was in Memphis, Tennessee, the night before he was assassinated. There was a big rally at the uh, Brother Mason's Church of, church of God in Christ Church, a very historical church. Actually, the Church of God in Christ was the very first Pentecostal denomination born out of the Azusa Street Revival. Bishop Mason was a godly man, and it was this building that was packed to the rafters with civil rights workers that had come and gathered in Memphis to protest uh, or to lend support, I should say, to a strike that was going on with some of the union workers of the city, which were African-American. And Dr. King was invited to preach. And that night, as the service was about to begin, he hadn't even left the hotel yet, it began to rain. I mean, the rain began to come down until there was actually water flooding the streets of parts of Memphis. And he looked at the rain. He said, nobody's going to show up. I'm, I'm, I'm not going. He was, he was exhausted. He had been on the road. He, his mind was frazzled. His body was tired. And he just didn't want to go. And he told Ralph Abernathy, go in my place. Nobody's going to be there. Well, when Dr. Abernathy got there, the place was jam-packed. There was no room for anyone. Every seat filled. People 
crowded in any spot that there was a space to put a body and there was somebody there. Dr. Abernathy realized that he was not going to be able to give a speech that would be received by the people. They had come for one reason. They had braved the elements for one reason, and that was to see Dr. King. And he called him, told him that the place is packed. You've got to come. He said, okay, send the car. Got dressed. They brought him in. I saw Dr. Abernathy in an interview several years after the assassination of Martin Luther King, and he said that night when Dr. King came in and was seated before they introduced him, he said it was obvious that his mind was not on the task at hand. He said, I'd never seen him look around to the degree that he was just looking all around. He was restless, fidgety. And he was never like that. He was very always calm and collected, Dr. Abernathy said. When they turned the service to him and he was to get up to speak, he, Dr. Abernathy said it was, uh, it was almost like it was an outer body experience. He was, he was speaking to the audience, but yet he was speaking beyond the audience. And I, don't, I don't really know how to explain that. You'd have to watch the clips for yourself, but it was like he was seeing beyond the audience sitting in front of him. And when they introduced him, he, he, he was very distracted, as I said, and he asked them to sing a song so he could collect his thoughts, and he requested the hymn, the song that we are bringing you today. As they sang it, he collected his thoughts, stepped back up to the microphone, and gave, in my opinion, one of the greatest speeches that I've ever heard in my life, a speech that I still today will go to YouTube and watch it over and over and over. It was the speech where he said that you're getting to the mountaintop. He said, I may not be there with you, but go on. He, he had a premonition that that night was his last night on earth. Literally, I'm serious. He knew that he was not going to be around much longer. Dr. Abernathy, commenting on it later, said that when I went back and watched and listened to the words he spoke, I'm thoroughly convinced that he knew that that night was his last night on earth. And of course, the next morning, he was cruelly assassinated at the Lorraine Motel in Memphis, Tennessee. And uh, a course of history was blazed by the sacrifice of one man. And we owe a debt of gratitude to men like Martin Luther King who put their life on the line for a cause that was just and a cause that was right. The song that we're talking about today was written by an African-American by the name of Thomas Dorsey. Brother Dorsey was born in 1899 in uh, Villa Rica, Georgia. That's about an hour, hour and a half outside of Atlanta, Georgia. And in the early 1900s, 1914, 1950, during World War I that was being raged in Europe at that time, Tommy Dorsey, along with so many other Southern African Americans, began to make their trek north to the city of Chicago. He was already musically oriented. He was already gifted in piano and singing, and he got caught up in the, the jazz and the blues world that was sweeping the city of Chicago and going across the nation at that time, and he was, became a nightclub singer. It's very interesting, some of his stage names. He performed under the names Georgia Tom, or Texas Tommy, or Barrel House Tom. Singing blues, singing jazz, but primarily blues. And it, it, it grabbed a hold of him, and he would remark later that it just kind of spoke to him, that style of music. He put together a band in 1925, and he was playing the piano and singing, and 
other singers stuff and he was appearing and with some of the major artists in the clubs of Chicago but it was a year later in 1926 he got sick he was so ill he didn't know if he was going to live and it was this time that he began to look in his heart and realize that his heart was not right with the Lord and in this time of great sickness and great illness Tommy Dorsey gave his heart to the Lord and he truly became born again. As soon as he recovered, he, he, he had no desire to go back into the nightclubs. He had no desire to be a blues singer. He started attending one of the most historic African-American Baptist churches in the entirety of the United States of America, the Pilgrim Baptist Church on the south side of Chicago. In 1932, he became the choir director there and would serve as choir director for Pilgrim Baptist Church in Chicago for 40 years. During this time, he was well known for lending his voice to African American revivals in different parts of the United States. He was invited during the month of August in 1932 to sing in what would be a very large revival in St. Louis, Missouri. He got there, and he, he really didn't want to go. He, was, he had not been married but a couple of years. His wife's name was Nettie, and she was pregnant, expecting their first child, as she was due any day. And he did not want to leave her, but circumstances, situation demanded, and reluctantly, he boarded a train, went to St. Louis. The revival was everything they said it was. The place was jam-packed every service. And the night that he was singing, he, he got up to sing, and the Lord began to move. And the people, they started responding, and he kept singing, and he kept singing, and he kept singing. No air conditioning. And he said he, he finally had sung until he was about ready to collapse. He was so exhausted. He said he finally sat down and was trying to gather his wits and his breath and wiping the sweat from his brow when a little boy made his way through the crowd, a Western Union messenger boy, and handed him a telegram. Now, he's sitting on the platform. He opened that telegram, and it said, all it said was, your wife has died. That's it. That's all it said. He literally collapsed. His strength left him. He got back to Chicago as fast as he could. When he got home, he found out, of course, his wife was dead, but she had delivered their child, a little boy. So here he is in the midst of two great emotional struggles, one of great sorrow, the death of his wife, one of great joy, the birth of his first child, a son. But that night, the little boy died. He was crushed. He buried the little boy in the arms of his mother in the same casket. He said later that, I lost it. My grief was so overwhelming that I literally shut myself in, locked the door, and would not have anything to do with anyone. He said, I was angry. I was angry at God, he said. He said, I, I, I thought God had dealt me a great injustice. But as the grief began to wear, he finally, after several days, was coaxed out of that room and one of his friends brought him into church, and he sat down at the piano, and he started running his fingers across the ivories. Then all of a sudden, out of a heart broken and a heart full of grief, the words began to tumble out, the words of a song that in a short time would be known all over the world. He began to sing, Precious Lord, take my hand. Lead me on, let me stand. 
I am tired, I am weak, I am worn. Through the storm, through the night, lead me on to the light. Precious Lord, take my hand and lead me on. That's the story behind the song. Now, let's go in and hear the song. Precious Lord, take my hand and lead me on. Won't you help me stand? See, I am tired. I That fateful day when 
Thomas Dorsey wrote that song, Precious Lord, Take My Hand. Another brother, his last name was Fry, was with him, who had been concerned about his mental state and had talked him out of a, from behind a locked door and brought him into church. And when he heard those words, he said, we've got to get that down. And they quickly copied the words down. And within a week, it was sung for the first time, but not by Thomas Dorsey, this dear brother, this friend of his that was so instrumental in bringing him out of his dark depression, brought it to Atlanta, Georgia, to the Ebenezer Baptist Church, pastored by Martin Luther King Sr. It was sung on a Sunday morning, one week after it had been written. It's kind of interesting, the comment that I found from studying this out, one of the staff members said that song tore the church up that morning as people begin to stand and worship and praise the Lord because it speaks to the everyday trials and tribulations that we all have. There's not a one of us that hasn't grieved. There's not a one of us that hasn't had a broken heart. There's not a one of us that has not had to face a mountain too tall or an ocean too wide. In other words, we couldn't do it by ourselves, but the Lord came along and touched us. He took our hand and he led us along. As I said, it was, it became one of the most frequently sung songs of the civil rights movement. And when I also said, when Martin Luther King died and they had his funeral, it was sung there. It was sung at the funeral of Lyndon Johnson as well. It's been sung all over the world. And I guess the most famous recording is the one by Mahalia Jackson. And it became so synonymous with her, even though she didn't write it, that when she passed, that was the song that Aretha Franklin sang at her funeral. When you look at all this, an African-American boy from the Deep South taken to the big city of Chicago, brought out of nightclubs, gives his heart to the Lord, suffers great trial and tribulation, and in the midst of it, his heart is still open enough that the Holy Spirit can give him words that would be comfort to hearts and lives all over the world 86 years later. But that's how the Lord works. When he gives something like that, it, it, it's, it's for us as an individual, but at times it becomes bigger than us. Because in our grief, if we allow the Lord, he can use us to touch others. And that's what he did with Thomas Dorsey. I can't remember the first time I heard the song. I was a little boy, but it's always been a song that has been dear to my heart. I hope that it's ministered to you. And I hope that now that you know the story behind the song, that now when you hear, precious Lord, take my hand, it will become even deeper, even richer, and even better for you. Well, as we always do, as we close, I am, I'm going to bring you back into the studio, and we're going to go out one more time with that great, great song, Precious Lord, Take My Hand. Before we do that, though, you know, I, I was kind of amazed. I, when we started putting this show together, and I, it actually came about, I was sitting at my desk, and I started thinking about hymns, and all of a sudden I took a piece of paper out, and I started writing the titles to all these hymns, and I was thinking, and I didn't know why I was doing it at first, but when I finished, I had about 25 or 30, and, and, and there were a few of them that I knew specific stories about them, but the rest of them I didn't. 
And I just said in my heart, there's more to this, these songs than what we know. And that's how this was born. But to my amazement, Precious Lord, Take My Hand was one of the first ones that I wrote down. And yet when I opened my hymn book, it was not in the hymn book. I, I had just always assumed that it was a hymn, but it, it's not in the hymn book. It should be, but it's not. Well, maybe in the next time that some denomination prints a hymn book, that somebody will have enough intelligence to include Precious Lord, Take My Hand. Let's go back into the song. God bless you. We'll see you next week. Thanks for joining us for the story behind the song with Pastor Donnie Swagger. A look at the words that inspire the great hymns of the church. We welcome your comments at facebook.com slash Donnie Swagger. The story behind the song is produced by the Sun Life Broadcasting Network.